Welcome to Grow Money Business, the podcast dedicated to helping business owners grow both their wealth and business on their own terms. Here's your host, Grant Bledsoe. Hello, everybody. Grant Bledsoe here. Welcome back to Grow Money Business. This week on the podcast, my guest is Tom Sanicandro. Tom is a practicing attorney. He's been an attorney for about 40 years in the great state of Massachusetts, and the last 20 years of his legal practice has focused on estate planning for families with special needs children. This is a huge area of need across the country, because if you think about leaving and bequesting your assets to your beneficiaries, whomever you want to receive your stuff after you die, adult special needs and and children with disabilities have unique circumstances because there are federal and state benefits programs available to help people with disabilities and special needs. But if you inherit assets of more than a very nominal amount, you no longer qualify for those programs. So what Tom does is he helps families in this situation by setting up what are called special needs trusts. He has a website that's devoted to helping lower income families devise wills and special needs trusts who may not have the resources to hire an attorney, um, which can co- often cost a couple thousand dollars. So Tom is our guest this week. We had a, we had a great conversation about uh, estate planning for families in this circumstance, and uh, he shares a lot of wisdom that he's picked up over the years as a practicing attorney. I hope you enjoy it. Hey, everybody. Real quick before we jump into today's episode, I have been advised by my attorneys to remind you all that none of what you might hear in today or any other episode of Grow Money Business is financial, investing, tax, legal, fitness, or even relationship advice. It's content that you're free to use and deploy on your own terms. And before you take any actions on what we might cover in the show, I really encourage you to consult with your accountant, attorney, or financial planner. If you don't have a financial planner and think that you might need one, be sure to check out threeoakswealth.com to learn more about my firm's planning, advice, and investment services. Okay, and we're live. I am here this week on the podcast with Tom Sanicandro. We had a little bit of technical difficulties. We're using Zoom to record today instead of our ordinary podcasting studio. Tom, thanks for uh, bearing with me on the technical stuff today. Uh, You sound great. You look great. And I'm, I'm happy to be here <laughs> talking to you on, on the show. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your legal practice. Great. Well, th- thank you, Grant. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to meet you and to talk to you about this. This is, as you know, this is an area that I'm deeply committed and interested and passionate about. So I, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. Um, I guess first off, uh, I'm the dad of a 37-year-old adult son who has Down syndrome. So my experience is long and deep as a parent. Um, I also have done disability law for um, more than 20 years at this point, doing all sorts of things, estate planning, guardianships, um, even sort of civil rights, education issues, all those things. Um, I also was in the Massachusetts legislature for 12 years in the House of Representatives. Um, and in that role, I was able to do a sort of a lot of public policy around areas, particularly for uh, adults with disabilities, but also kids with disabilities, special education and all that type of thing. Um, I also was for a few years the director of a research institute at the University of Massachusetts, um, where we really delved into the disability issues. Um, We were actually a global uh, disability research institute. We had projects all around the world that we were working on, um, mainly to advance the rights and um, opportunities for individuals with disabilities. Um, and then for educational background, I have a PhD from Brandeis, a law degree from Suffolk University, and a master's in public administration from Harvard University. And um, I guess how you found me is that I have created, and it's actually a nonprofit to a nonprofit website to um, assist families and give them the resources around the estate planning tools that they need um, if they have a child or a family member who has a disability um, because there's some special things that you need to do to protect assets and to make sure that that person gets the assets that they need to be successful as well as to retain government benefits. 
So that's that's yeah. who I am and what I've been working on. Well, kudos to you for all the work that you've you've put into this topic throughout your career. Where, so it sounds like you were a practicing attorney, and were you, what kind of law were you focusing on? It, it sounds like um, when you had your son, that probably drove a lot of your interest in this field specifically. Did, did you have exposure to to this topic prior to having your son? No, and, and so I. I presume most of your guests can't see me, so um, I'm a mature guy. I Before I actually started doing disability law, I worked for 25 years as a corporate lawyer. So um, I did that practice first. Um, when I had my son, it, it really stemmed around the issue of education. Um, for a while, I could bluff the school system because I was a lawyer. Um, but eventually, I got to the point where I actually had a no special education law to get things done. And that's where my practice started to transition from corporate law to disability law. Interesting. And that, Interesting. Was, that was more than that was 20 something years ago that I did that transition. Um, that's also how I got involved in the legislature. I, you know, I, I really saw that there was a need to get some laws passed and to get folks with disabilities um, a voice in the legislature and, and in that sort of public policy process. Um, and we did a lot of great things. It wasn't obviously me alone. You can't, especially in a House of Representatives, you need to get a lot of people on board. But there was a lot of people that were excited by what we could do. And we did a lot in Massachusetts. Um, you know, in some ways, we led the country um, in some of the work we've done in Massachusetts. So that's that's, that's great. That as well. But it, out of curiosity, yeah. can, can you be more specific? What what was the landscape like for someone with disabilities before those policy well, actions? And then what, what did you help get passed? Yeah, I guess uh, two major pieces of legislation. The policy landscape really is not good. I get, think, you know, for in a lot of ways, there's still we still have a long way to go as a nation on how we treat people and think about people with disabilities. I think that there's just not a lot of, um, I, you know, sometimes they're looked as someone less than or um, the other, you know, that they're someone that's not us and we don't really understand them. And um, particularly around the area of intellectual disabilities, folks with intellectual disabilities get, um, you know, treated like infants their entire life rather than the adults that they are. So a lot of what I was doing was looking at how do we give these individuals the opportunity to do that. Um, the biggest piece of legislation uh, we called the Real Lives Bill. Um, what happens if you have an intellectual disability? Um, typically, if you need the support of the state, you end up living in a group home. Um, and that group home you don't have any choice about it. They just like assigned you to this group home. So you're assigned to a group home with individuals that you don't know, and you may not even like, which is not the best uh, situation. And then you're stuck at the mercy of whoever's working at the group home on what you want to do. So in Massachusetts, we turn that on its head. Partially, the reason why it works that way is because typically the state contracts with um, the provider agencies. And this is the way it works in most every state. Um, so the provider agency has control over everything. Um, and we flipped that on its head in Massachusetts. We gave the individual with a disability and their family the right to make their own contracts and to get money directly from the, from the department in Massachusetts called the Department of Developmental Services. So that gave individuals the right to live where they wanted to do who they wanted to live with, what did they want to do with their free time, as well as to purchase the supports with state money to do that and allow that to happen. Interesting. So that was, that was a big move. Um, the other um, major piece, we were the first state in the country to provide public um, funding for individuals with intellectual disabilities to attend our public higher education um, universities, state colleges, and community colleges. So that was another big piece. And that's another piece that's moving within the disability community and really growing quickly. Um, and it's something that most people don't know about and really have trouble wrapping their head around um, people with intellectual disabilities in college. 
Yeah. One, one thing that uh, kind of struck a chord with me as, as you were um, describing that was how, how much the rules and regulations and the protocols um, differ state to state. And this is not something that they ever teach you in financial planning school or when you're obtaining your CFP or designations or any of that. Um, it kind of came to light for, for me. We, we, we've, we've got a, a number of clients with uh, dependent adult children. One of them specifically um, was, had, um, she, she has a son, she was living in California, and then she moved to Illinois. And the son was set up pretty well with uh, the local services that he needed. But when she moved to Illinois and the son came with her, the system out there was based on not need, but a lottery believe it or not, it was, it, it, it's a lottery system to get him the stuff that he needed in general. And that just, it's, it, it, I, I couldn't believe that, but um, long story short, I think they've resolved it. And uh, the son is um, now residing in California again. Um, and, and so he's in a better situation, but, but this whole, everything you've just described uh, and the, the, the limited experience I have on this with, with a few clients just goes to show that it needs a specialized um, type of planning. And when we think of estate planning in general, we want to make sure that we bequeath our assets whenever we pass to the people or organizations we want. And you probably want to do that in the most efficient way possible with paying the least amount of tax and make sure that it changes hands as quickly as you can. And when, when you have dependent kids with special needs, that's not uh, you don't use the same vehicles. So could you talk a little bit about asset protection and what we need to think about in, in these circumstances? Sure. Let me just first tell you what the what the issue is, right? Um, and it, let's talk about someone. We'll just use an example: an individual who has an intellectual disability or um, um, autism spectrum disorder, or something like that. It's going to require um, financial support throughout their life, right? They they may have employment either part time or full time. But because of their disability and the nature of their disability, it's highly likely that they're not going to be completely self-supporting. So for those individuals, one of the primary sources of income is a supplemental security income. And that's an income that is through the Social Security Administration. Um, and it's for individuals who have a significant disability where they really can't work to make enough money to, to um thrive, if you will. Um, that income from that particular um, benefit program um, in Massachusetts, it's it, if you live on your if you're an individual with an individual uh, disability and you live on your own, that benefit is about eight hundred and fifty dollars a month, um, which is not sizable, but it really helps, you know, how you do this and how you put things together. Um, there's also Medicaid, right, which is the state funded, federally funded, but state um, administered um, health program. Um, there's also housing programs. Um, there's what was formerly referred to as food stamps, the SNAP program. All those programs I mentioned have an asset limitation, right? So if you have too much money, you don't get that. SSI, which is the supplemental security income, which I talked about first, that asset limitation is $2,000. And I can talk to you what that asset limitation, how it works from my own experience, uh, as well as from the legal side, just so people understand it. Please, please do. <laughs> so so the, the asset limitation is $2,000, which means if you have more than $2,000 in assets in your bank account, SSI will no longer give you that $850 that you get in Massachusetts. It's a, it varies across the country between $750 and about $850 a month. How it works, though, is, and this has happened to my son in the past because I he had a bank account that I wasn't aware of. And at one point, he had two, $2,035, right? So he's $35 above the asset limitation. Six months go by, Social Security writes a letter and say, okay, you owe us $5,600 because you are over the asset limitation by that $35. So for the six months that we gave you the whatever at that time was about seven, eight hundred dollars 
you need to pay that back to us. So you need to pay back that $5,600. So those are the types of issues that can happen. But if you think about it, if you have, say you have a child with a significant intellectual disability who's collecting SSI and you leave them money in your will or from your retirement account or from your um, life insurance policy and you put them over $2,000, they're no longer eligible for all these benefits that I just talked to you about. So that's a problem, right? Because for some um, individuals, you know, health, the healthcare field or the healthcare insurance field is changing as with new laws, but Medicaid can be a lifeblood for a lot of folks with uh, disabilities because they need that extra um, more robust insurance. They're going to be paying lots of money out. And so that's really critical. So all those things are super critical. You can protect, you can still continue to get all those government benefits if you have a disability. If the money you have is put into a special needs trust, a special needs or supplemental needs trust. And that's what the website that I have provides those documents, as well as a lot of information about it. And I'll I'll just turn to give you a chance to ask questions or to fill in, because I know I kind of dumped a whole lot of information at once out there. No, that's 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 exactly where I was hoping that the the conversation would head. Um, And and so two thousand dollars in assets is the threshold. Does that liquid assets if you have. It gets complicated. It course. gets complicated. <laughs> <laughs> there's countable assets and there's non-countable assets. Um, so actually the home is non-countable and a car is non-countable. Um, but the the um, liquid assets are that $2,000. So generally it's liquid assets, I guess, is the short answer to that to that question. Got it. Got it. But $2,000 is not not very much money. So th- th- by creating a special needs trust, you create this entity, you put money into it for the benefit of your dependent, and there is a trustee to manage uh, uh, and, and handle and distribute those funds after you pass for the benefit of your dependent. Uh, am I describing that correctly? Exactly right. So one of the things that I, I think a lot of people run into in this situation, at least the few the few conversations I've had with clients in this situation is, hey, that sounds like a great vehicle. We definitely want to preserve uh, our, our kids' SSI after we're gone. We, we realize that this is a great vehicle and a great opportunity, but I'm not really sure who to name as the trustee of this thing to handle their affairs after we pass. That's That requires a heck of a lot of trust. How, how do you go about selecting someone to handle that account and that trust after you're gone? Well, um, that's that's challenging. Obviously, you want someone who has the same sort of um, thinking and philosophy that you do about money and about how to support that person. Um, that can be really challenging to find um, someone, a family member to do that. Uh, and typically, it is done by a family member. And what, given the way, uh, you know, my website is to really to address sort of middle income and lower income folks so that they have the opportunity to do this. Um, And typically those folks are going to be using a family member to do that. Um, One of the things that, you know, from (laughs) I'll I'll talk, I'll use my own experience to talk about and then I'll move off to something else too. Um, So in, in, in our family, what I have four kids, which makes, makes my selection process much broader than a lot of people. Um, you know, I have the one son with Down syndrome and then I have two more boys and a, and a girl. And um, they've always been involved with my son, even though he's the oldest, but they've been involved in the process. They even can um, sit now. We, for, if, if someone listening to this podcast has someone with a disability, they're going to know what I'm talking about. But during the school process, there's a, um, special education, there's something called the IEP, the team meeting, where everybody sits around and decides what's best for the kid. Um, When you become an adult and you're getting adult services, it's called a a ISP meeting. Same thing. A lot of people sit around. We routinely have 
our other kids sit in on that meeting with my son to have their input and to hear what's going on. Um, so that in a lot of ways, they've been educated in this process. Um, my oldest daughter is also an attorney, so it makes it really even easier. So under our, um, our trust that she's named as the trustee. So, so I guess the, the point of that story is if you, you know, is to bring along family members, if you can, bring them into the process to let them understand what's happening. If that's someone you wanted to do that and someone you, you trust, they don't have to really be knowledgeable about any of that. They can just be someone who you trust with money. Um, so that's another thing. There's also um, professional trust, like any trust, right? You can get a professional trustee to do this. The challenge with the market that I'm approaching is that typically those folks don't have a lot of money. Yeah. Um, there's also something called a pooled trust, which is to reach that group. But it's you know it's best obviously if you can have a family member that'll just do this and someone you can trust. But there's different professional organizations that will actually act as trustee for you. Um, but that may not be a choice for for the market that um. I'm approaching or trying to address. Sure, sure. So walk us through the process of actually creating the, the trust, either by using your your the resources through your website or maybe approaching an attorney. You walk into the sure. attorney's office, they you you talk about it. Let's say that the, the decision has been made to create a special needs trust. What happens next? So I'll put in a little plug from my website at this point. It's called do. Special Needs Trusts online.com so that's special needs trusts online.com um that website will actually works more like uh any one of those legal websites that you're familiar with like legal zoom or rocket lawyer and those types of things um it's just a simplified version tip when i did my sort of market research for this i was looking for this product online um there were very few on available online um, the ones that were online, though, that I found, even as a lawyer who's been working in this field for, for more than 20 years, found very difficult and challenging to use. Um, so on our website, you go through, they, you ask all the questions. And what it does is it either for a single um, parent or for a married couple, it will generate wills for each of those individuals. Um, as well as create the special needs trust all in one document, all, not in one document, but in one effort, uh, one procedure through the website. And what happens, and this is the, even if you go to a lawyer, what happens, what you need is your wills need to be drawn to leave any asset to the child with a disability to the trust, right? If it's not in the trust, you've lost everything. It needs to be in the trust to be protected. So on our website, the wills are drawn in a way to make sure that the money or assets for the child with a disability goes directly to the trust. And that's why they're created together to make sure that they sync together. Um, that's exactly what a lawyer would do. And this is actually these, um, what you get on the website is what I was typically doing for clients individually. Um, it's really exactly the same. So what the lawyer would do would be, again, draft wills to leave money directly to the trust. And the trust, the way, what makes it a special needs trust is that there's, if you will, magic language within the trust itself that says that the purpose of the trust is to supplement, not to supplant government benefits. Mm. That's the meat of the trust. And that's what happened. So whatever, um, you know, in, I'm still practicing as well. So and sometimes I review um, people come to me with their trust that were done and I review their trust documents. And that's the language that I'm looking for, because some of the trusts, you know, like I said, I'm preparing trusts for individuals that are middle income or, you know, lower income. If you're a very high income individual, you're also concerned about um, estate planning issues, tax estate taxes. Um, sometimes the special needs trust will be rolled into um, sort of a very complicated trust that's going to solve lots of issues for you. 
um, estate planning. I think what's the federal is now up like $14 million for a federal estate before it's taxed. Um, some states are very low, though. Massachusetts is among the lowest at $1 million, which is, you know, given the, even the, the value of real estate in Massachusetts, that it's easy to bounce over that $1 million asset. But those are things that your attorney would be considering as they look at your estate. Like, do you need um, to be planning around taxes for the estate purposes or estate planning purposes? Um, but essentially, the, the meat is the same. The will that leaves the money for that child directly to the trust. And I just want to jump in somewhere else that's really, really critically important around this line is that one of the things that people can forget about is their life insurance policies. They need to make sure that they, instead of naming the child with a disability as a beneficiary under the life insurance policy, they need to name the trust for that individual child under the policy. The same with your retirement accounts. That's another thing that people seem to forget about, that they may have money in a 401k or whatever it is, to make sure that the money is not left directly to the individual with a disability. There's another caveat that's also in there is sometimes you may have wealthy, um, you know, uh, parents or other relatives that are going to leave money to that child. Um, you got to make sure that that when they do it, they leave the money directly to the trust and not to that child directly. Right. Right. Okay. So if if, if you have one one people come to to the website, they fill out the questionnaire, they get wills that leave all of their assets to the trust and they get the trust documents to create this trust. Are there any state to state nuances that would invalidate any of that work? Is is this universal across all 50 states? Yeah, and and mainly because it's federally based. Um, The only thing that's that's different is what what can happen around the law of a particular state around wills or trusts, right? And that's, Mm -hmm. as we go on in time, that's becoming more and more standardized everywhere across the country. Um, there's a, there's a, a statutory scheme um, called the Uniform Probate Code. Mm-hmm. Um, Uniform Probate Code is essentially a lot of smart lawyers get together and draw up what the ideal laws would be for probate, you know, probating a will or trust in a particular state. And at this point, I don't know, I think it's close to like 40 states have absorbed, have, um, adopted the Uniform Probate Code. But there's really, the only variance that I see among the states is that some states will allow less than that, like a will that's handwritten, or even, you know, I think some states still even allow a verbal will. The What you get from our website would be what meets the criteria in every state. I see. That meets that basic criteria in every state. <clears throat> California, uh, where we live, and we have a lot of clients, as I understand it, is one of the few states that has not adopted the Uniform Probate Code. And I'm sure there's some story and history behind that, but I'm I'm unaware of it personally. <laughs> so a difficult legislature is what can happen. So you never know. I, I yeah that that would make a lot that would make a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so you you have you have a document that adheres to the Uniform Probate Code. So so just to be clear. Right. Does somebody who lives in California, uh, do, do the documents produced by your website, um, is that going to work in California, knowing that it's one of the states that has not adopted the Uniform Probate Code? Yes. Yes. Okay. They're, they're valid in, in all 50 states. Okay. So you go to the website, you answer the questions, you have wills and a special needs trust document. What happens next? You probably need to notarize it. Yeah. So there's another piece that, that differentiates what we do compared to other sites is that you can actually go on my site and click and set up an appointment to meet with me um, and to go over what your needs are. And then we can I can actually discuss a lot of what we already discussed on this podcast. Um, I would discuss with the clients so that they're familiar with what it is they're doing so that they understand what they're doing. 
and that they they have all that knowledge. Um, I even find that some clients come back in after they do it and say, I just did it. Can you take a look at it and make sure it's okay uh, that it meets the needs that we have? Um, what I'm seeing, so the way the website was drawn is it's really for sort of the regular, either um, a single adult with children, one kid with a disability, or married couple with children, one kid with a disability, or just even just one kid with a disability. What I'm seeing is sometimes people will call and say, well, I have two kids on the autism spectrum. So then I would go in and tweak for them and, and produce the what they need. So there is some give and take in some education that I provide, even just like we are on Zoom um, with families that are going through this process. Right, right. That And that that's uh, another thing I was going to ask you. I, I would sense that a lot of people are somewhat reluctant to rely on uh, a document that just pulled directly from the website without direct interaction with an attorney such as yourself. Do, do you have right. to be licensed by the all all the uh, state bars in order to do that? Just out of curiosity, how does that how does that work? So I am only licensed in Massachusetts, um, and I'm only acting as a lawyer for folks that are going to be in Massachusetts. Hmm. But what I'm providing them is really information about the website and the way that the the tool works and what's produced for them. Um, so really I'm not acting as a lawyer when I do that. I, I can't sure. you know, take off my knowledge that I already have when I'm talking to someone, but it's really run, the whole, the website is run through a nonprofit corporation. Um, so it's, it, it operates uh, independent of me. Um, but I do provide that same uh, sort of hands-on description of what it is we're doing, making sure that what they're buying is the same, is what they need. Um, and they move ahead that way. And that that was a, I didn't even answer your question yet. So let me get back to your question was, what do they do after they get the forms? So um, what the, on the form itself, they get this a link that clicks, which is a description about how to get them, how to get the will signed and notarized um, from any of you, any lawyers who happen to be listening or anybody involved in this process knows that that's a very technical thing that has to happen. Anybody who's gone through law school knows how easily you can screw that process up, right? So what the website provides is actually even in a resource listed on the resources on the website is how to execute a will. Um, the way it's laid out, it's almost like a play. So it says, you know, this is what the notary says. They ask this person this question. They ask the person signing the question, they're signing the, the will, the, these questions, and it's laid out exactly like a play with, if this is your role, this is what you say, um, and it just follows down to do that. What I'm finding, which is surprising, is that that people seem to be having no problem getting all this done. Um, wow. that's, the, that's the feedback that I get. Well, yeah, that was my response too, because that's <laughs> kind of the, the challenge is to do it. And like powers of attorney and those types of things, and the, even the, um, the trust, uh, typically they're just notarized. The tricky one is the will, um, but the, 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 the instructions are specific, very specific. So it's easy to follow along. I just say, you know, bring these instructions with you when you're getting the will signed. And, you know, you can hand them to the notary. The notary can sort of run through the whole process that needs to, to happen. Sure, sure. So th the way that this is structured, the, you're, you're, you're creating wills, you're creating trusts that are, now are the trusts created uh, when, every, when the wills are signed to, or is the trust created upon the death of uh, the parents? So the way it, <laughs> it's even... Even my will gets a little complicated that you should get through the website. Um, so what happens if we're just talking about the, the, the child with special needs? Mm -hmm. um, that's a separate document. That trust is created separate from the will. Okay. Um, it's actually, when you get it, it's a separate PDF. So it's printed out. And it's You can tell when you print it out that it's a separate document. Um, but the way it's, it's, the way you would do it is you would sign the wills and sign the trust. So the trust would be created then. Um, there's also another complicating factor 
is once the trust is created, in order to open a bank account, you need a tax ID. So just to, and that's done through the um, Internal Revenue Service. They have a, a website and there's a link on the website that brings you there to, you need to um, fill out the, to get a tax ID number for your, for your trust. Um, but for, sure. for, for our, for our listeners, it, it, if, if you're halfway computer savvy, it takes you less than 10 minutes to do it. You get a piece of paper in the mail a week or two later with the number that you need to provide it, 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 that, That's a pretty simple step. Yeah. Yeah. The IRS has actually even improved that now that you just click a button and they, the PDF appears on your screen. So you don't even have to wait for it to come anymore. And Ooh, they generate nice. the code and it, the number's right there. So yeah, it takes about 10 minutes is probably even generous at this point. The IRS is, is coming along. They know how to take your money. And that's part of what the whole process is. Um, there was another part of your question, which I, I have forgotten on that, on um, the execution. Well, what, what, one question, let me, let me redirect us just a little bit. Uh, one thing that comes to mind to me at this point is, is there any reason uh, or any benefit to funding the trust while you're still alive as opposed to waiting until after you die? I, I, at this point, I don't think so. Um, that's my experience. Um, the, 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 the problem is that it creates um, this complications when you do that, right? Because now you have a trustee who's handling money. It needs its own tax return. There's a lot of stuff this has to happen. So I typically do not suggest that people fund it unless there's some reason to do that. Right now, there's something called an ABLE account. Um, and an ABLE account is an account um, like some of your, I'm sure your listeners are familiar with 529 accounts that for when you go into college that you can put money, um, typically tax-free, it'll grow tax-free in this account as long as it's spent on the kid's college. So there's a companion um, vehicle now called an ABLE account, and that's for someone with a disability where, you again, you can put money in the ABLE account um, that grows tax-free. And it can be used for specific things to assist the individual with a disability to pay for things. Um, the ABLE account can also shield up to $100,000 from um, SSI. So that if you have an ABLE account, you can create an ABLE account. Um, put, I think that the limitation is whatever the um, you know estate tax limitation is now, I think it's 14,000 a year. You can put up to $14,000 a year in the ABLE account. Um, and that money can be used to support the individual with a disability. And it also acts as a shelter. So, you know, just because you have uh, the special needs trust doesn't mean you should not also create an ABLE account for money to use now. So I guess the answer to that question is you're, you know, the trust is created at the point when you do your will. So you're all set to go and you put your, you um, identify that as the beneficiary under your um, retirement account, as well as um, your life insurance policy. But there's no reason not to create a ABLE account as well to go ahead and do that, you know, to, to have a place where you can put resources for the person with a disability that it's not going to affect their benefits for either housing or uh, SSI or anything else. Right, right. And and, the, and that limit has actually gone up this year to 16,000. So you have a little bit more more room, but the $100,000 threshold as I understand it has not changed. So if at any point right. the contents of your your 529 able account exceeds $100,000, that's going to impact your SSI eligibility, which kind of negates the whole reason you're doing that in the first place. Um, <laughs> right. One one thing that I, that I can I can think of. You mentioned Massachusetts having an estate tax threshold of one million dollars. Here on the West Coast, California does not have an estate tax, but Oregon and Washington do, and Oregon is also at one million dollars. So one thing that's that's come to mind for our clients in the past is. If you give money while, while you're alive, if you fund the special needs trust while you're still alive, you're getting that out of your estate before the assets grow in value. And yes, the moment you put assets into the trust, you have, you have some additional complications. You have a trustee involved. The trust has to file a tax return. 
those are uh, nuisances you might want to might not want to deal with. But you know, if you're in your mid 40s or 50s and you have assets that are going to go to your dependent kids anyway, it might make a lot of sense to get it out of your trust before it grows in value and will therefore um, be eligible to to uh, be taxed at the uh, uh, or to pay the estate tax, I should say. So it, it, it adds, you know, a couple extra nuances there, but it, it can be helpful in some circumstances. Am, am I off on that at all? That, that's no, how I've no. thought about it so far. No, you're absolutely right. That's that's a good way to think about it. But, it, you know, it depends on your clients and who you're thinking about and what their financial situation is. But right. you're absolutely right. That's a reason to do that, right? Because yeah. you can protect much more than 100000 Right. You know, that's so it's, you know, I think part of my point was depending on what your income is that, but don't just think that the able account and the trust account are, or the trust special needs are mutually exclusive. They yeah. can be used in conjunction with each other as you go through this process, but you're yeah. absolutely right. If it's going to be, it's, it's another way to shelter um, money and assets from the estate tax by moving it into the special needs trust. So that's, that's a great idea to do it that way. And, and, and I, I, I like the way you phrased it. And, and, and I would, I would think that your baseline should be don't put any money in the special needs trust until it passes through your will after you pass it. it don't put money in the trust while you're alive, unless there's a specific clear reason for that. Absolutely. Cause it's going to be a lot easier for you probably. Uh, yeah. That's what, you know, he, I, you don't want to make things so complex that people don't understand how they work and they they're not getting the benefit of them because they don't they're too difficult to work with. So that's that's another part of it. I want to do raise um, one other point about the the website and what's there. Um, it has wills and trusts. It also has powers of attorney. We also offer a document that's free. That's really important that we spend some time talking about. It's called a letter of intent, um, and a letter of intent is essentially a document that you create um, that fills in information about your child with a disability and what your vision is and what their vision is for themselves as they grow up. Um, The letter of intent also contains lists of doctors and their phone numbers, uh, diagnosis, um, friends, their phone numbers, relatives and their phone numbers. It's like a document that you create that should you pass away suddenly, someone can step in and know exactly where you are or were with your child with a disability so they can step in and start to move the way they really need to. Um, And I think that's an important, you know, everybody listening to the podcast who has a family member with a disability should go in, download the letter of intent, fill it out and leave it with your important papers so that, you know, should something happen, you know, catastrophic, that's not planned, that someone can be there to step in and, and get things to move for your child with a disability the way it should. That's that's a great thought and a huge benefit to whoever is stepping in. And even if you don't have a child with a disability, just having a letter of instruction on the front page of your state plan of this is what I want to happen. It may not be legally binding, but here's some right. some guidance right. for my executor to take take and run with is, is it just a, a massive benefit. One other question I had for you, Tom, is, is so we, we've established the, the, the structure of how this can work. You, you leave your assets to a special needs trust uh, through your will. The trust is created while you're still alive. At that point, you've named a trustee for the trust of who's going to be responsible for handling and distributing the assets from the trust for the benefit of, of your um, dependent child. But we've not talked about powers of attorney for perhaps... Uh, medical decisions. And that's another important angle here. Um, Do do you see people typically naming the same person that's responsible for the trust is also going to be responsible for helping medical decisions? I think um, there may be a different skill set for that. Um, So you need to think about what that person is doing, what you're asking that person to do. Typically, the trustee is a person who's really good with money right? Someone who understands money and understands that whole process. The person with the power of attorney and around healthcare decisions may not be that same person. It may be someone that's more, um, that thinks more about, um, 
you know, maybe they have a medical background, maybe they have a, you know, the, the, their philosophy of life is the same as yours or something like that. Those are, they, they're, they're a different skill set, right? Because someone you're sort of turning over all legal, the right to make legal decisions for you. Um, the other one, you're, um, it's, it's money decisions. So they, they typically do not end up being the same, um, the same person. Uh, they can be, obviously you can get someone who you trust, um, with all these types of things. And that makes sense. Um, but they don't necessarily have to be the same person. Sure. Sure. Okay. I also remembered one of the things that I forgot to tell you before, and I don't know how you, maybe we'll cut this out later. Um, <laughs> but the, the fact that I was talking about that the trust is complicated because the will actually does create a, a it's called the testamentary trust is any trust created under a will. And the testamentary trust is created for any child who's, who takes money, who's under the age of 25. And it creates a little trust within the will that says they don't get the money until they turn 25, unless their trustee, you know, turns it over to them or whatever. Um, just because typically people don't make great decisions around money until they're at least 25, sometimes a lot older than that, but, uh, but the will, the will's drawn that way. So it does create this little testamentary trust for anybody who's taking, um, before that, before the age of, uh, who's not reached the age of 25 yet. That is a very helpful provision. I've in a, n- a number of times run into people who've planned on giving everything to their kids, but uh, what happens if they're 18 or 19 and come into one or $2 million? That's, that's, that's a pretty dangerous party risk. time. <laughs> party time. That's right. Party time is right. Yeah. 25. I, I, I like that. You, you, you can also uh, create the language to split it up 50% at 25, 50% at 30 or whatever age you feel is appropriate too. is another popular way to, to draw it up. So what, what's on your plate right now with, with regard to building the site and providing this service to the demographic that you're trying to help? I think it's just trying to grow to, to, to get the word out about the site. I think it's a hugely valuable um, site. You know, the, the cost for the two wills and the special needs trust is $499, $500. Um, typically in Massachusetts, that price to do, to get that done in Massachusetts is typically between $3,500 and $5,000 now in Massachusetts. Um, I actually had a <clears throat> someone on the site who I was talking to from South Dakota. Their numbers were even higher than Massachusetts. Um, North Dakota, I'm sorry. Um, that they're the, the cost to do it there. So what this does is provides an economical way for people to protect their loved one with a disability and not rack up huge costs that, you know, maybe they don't have the money to do that. Um, that's, that's a great reason to use this site. The other reason to use the site, which is from my experience being a lawyer for as long as I am, is that people don't like to do their wills. They just, that's one of the things they put off. And usually I get the frantic cold phone call, we're going on vacation without the kids. We don't have any wills. This is another at least stopgap that you can do that. If you're ever in that situation and you have a kid with a disability, go on the site, do them, go on vacation. And then, you know, if you've got lots of money and you need some more careful estate planning around tax, estate tax purposes, fix it later on, but you'll at least get the, 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 the approach done that, that everybody will be in a good place when you're, when you're gone, if you don't make it back from vacation. <laughs> so what kind of stuff are you doing to get the word out about the site? Um, mainly it's just, it's just through um, social media. And it's just, it takes a long time to build and doing podcasts as well. So I appreciate you having me on to do this. Um, It's, it's, you know, I think it's a a very valuable site, but it's hard to sort of get it out with the noise. Um, Also, for some reason, because not many people providing this, if you type in Google, say, special needs trusts online, um, just that you're looking for that, we're the first non-paid site to come up. Um, so, you know, we're the, the, the social media and 
you know, the and Google are working in our favor. But, you know, we really need to get the word out as much as we can because it provides a valuable service for families who are in this situation and don't know what to do and may not want to shell out, you know, five grand to do this at this point or may not be in a position to do that. But they still have life insurance policies and retirement accounts and some assets that they really want to protect so that their, their kid with a disability will be well taken care of after they're gone. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is absolutely a valuable service and, and kudos to all the, for you, uh, to, to you for all the work that you put in on this over the years. Um, do you have a blog or anything like that? that that's, that's helpful no, for driving I, that kind of traffic I to, too. I guess I need to do that. I need to, that's probably the, the next step. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just getting ready to start putting out my first newsletter and that type of thing, but I really need to be producing more. Um, you're absolutely right. That's a reminder of on my list of things to do is to get that blog going. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a lot of energy to do that, obviously. So, uh, you know, yeah. I need to sort of gear up for that. But, we're, you know, we're doing all those things. I think there is a lot of there's a presence on social media and the podcast and a lot of stuff we've been doing. Actually, even uh, I also, like I said, I have a degree from um, Brandeis and their alumni magazine did a highlight of the of the the website and me and what we're doing and all that kind of thing. So it's getting out. It's slow, but sure. Um, yeah. But I, I do appreciate you me having on and uh, talking about it is, you know, as much as we can do to reach out and get, let people know about this, this, uh, you know, opportunity that's here for them to, to take advantage of, to protect their family as they move ahead. Well, it's, it's, it's my pleasure. And before we wrap it up, what, uh, remind everybody what the URL of the site is. Specialneedstrustsonline.com. Okay. So specialneedstrustsonline.com. Trust, just singular it, or plural? Trust. trust. Yeah, I believe it. Let me, let me go on and look right now. <laughs> but if you search uh, special needs trust, yeah, POMS is yeah, the number it, one. Yeah, actually it's... Ranking it Plural. But if you do special needs trusts online, if you just Google that, it'll come right up. Got it. Okay. Well, Tom, thank you again for joining me today. This has been really helpful as a topic we've not covered on the podcast in the past. And uh, I really appreciate you being here and sharing some of your, your wisdom that you've picked up over the years um, as a practicing attorney. So, so thank you. Great. Thank you, Grant. It was a pleasure. Nice talking to you. Nice meeting you. And uh, thanks for inviting me on. Likewise, we'll have we'll have you back on uh, here sometime down the road as the laws evolve around us. Great. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Grow Money Business, the podcast dedicated to helping business owners grow both their wealth and business on their own terms. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you digest podcasts to ensure you don't miss out on future episodes and announcements. And feel free to submit questions to growmoneybusiness.com.